will not agree with that change. So go ahead and do that. And that was our learning. It's tough. It's easy to say it today. It's tough. And we'll show you more of such decisions that we had to end up taking. But this was critical for us. And as soon as we did that, again, you know, people, people are not necessarily supporting you on this. So we went out and created our first product. We created a Band-Aid product which just barely worked. Our whole hypothesis was, you know, forget about getting the best product out, get a product out. And as soon as you get a product out, iterate on it as fast as you can. So we came out with our product towards the end of the year, got some initial traction. 31st December, our servers crashed. Great sign. You know, while I was very happy, my CTO was just cursing. And we, we, because we got initial mar market traction, that's the sign of market traction, that your servers crashed. Great sign. And so, you know, we were, we were far more excited because we were getting the market traction. But what happened, we ran out of money. That one should never do. Like, don't run out of money. We did that. We ran out of money. And then we had to essentially get into this mode of trying to optimize do creative financing deals with vendors. Like it was very simple, actually. It was not even so creative. It was just going to vendors and saying, we don't have money. What can you do? We don't have money. We have run out of money. And here is my personal promise to you. In May of 2008, I will pay you 25% more than your invoice price. Take it or leave it. But they had no option. They had to take it. So we ran the company for two months for about 25,000 rupees on 14 credit cards. 14 credit cards. We maxed out every credit card. We, we, started, we stopped paying bills of, of our credit cards. We were fine with the fines. We were only paying the minimum, minimum amount so that no goons come into our office and beat us up. But we were quite confident that we were not gonna, we can't make the credit card payment. So forget it. We were just maxing out our credit cards. We were left with one credit card before we got funded, by the way. But I, I'm not suggesting that you should do that, by the way. Please don't do this, because that's, that was horrendous period. Uh, while, uh, you know, people were figuring out how to eat and where to eat from, it's not a good thing to be in because, you know, uh, it's tough. But I think what it did for us was it basically put the team very close. It basically showed to me the, the resilience that the team had, the conviction that the team had on what we were trying to do. We put all of that together and that's, you know, th when that happens, that's magic. There is nothing better than going through that magic moment when you see your team coming together in a room and saying, ditch it, here is my credit card, here is everything I've got, don't pay me. We will make this work, we will not pay anybody. It's fantastic. Go through that experience, it's good. Once in a lifetime at least it's good. So we went out, um, you know, early 2007, we, we went out raising venture capital money. So I, you know, every venture capitalist in India, so it was quite obvious and simple choice to go out uh, pitching to them. And we did that. Everybody kicked us out, literally. Nobody except one venture capitalist took our second meeting. It was shocking for me, I, you know, I was just, it was shocking because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you, you're very, you're not very, you know, on one side, you're being very stubborn on what you want to do. On the second side, if somebody's not, able, not willing to put any money on you, you know, you're not in a good situation there. You actually have no idea what to do now. And the, the problem that we had is that nobody was believing our story. Nobody was believing that mobile internet, thus mobile advertising, can be big. Irrespective of howsoever, you know, structures and examples you try and give them. It didn't work. So what did we, you know, I took a flight. I took a flight to Silicon Valley. It's as simple as that. You take a flight to Silicon Valley, start going visiting people on Sandal Road. That's what we did. We started visiting people on Sandal Road. So in the first scenario, when I was in India, when we were visiting venture capitalists in India, everybody said the team is great. Anyway, you know, you figure your way around those 45 minutes. We get the money. Uh, we raised about $7 million, and the key things that came out for me was as follows. As all of you kind of go through this cycle of raising money, 
make sure your venture capitalist buys into your vision. Please do not change your vision for the VC. Please do not do that. Your vision is the one that's going to give you success, not the VC's, because if it were his, his vision, he should have been doing it. So please do what you think is right. And make sure, don't get a wrong VC. With a VC, with a good VC, life is tough. With a bad VC, it's hell. So please make sure you're not getting a, a bad VC. And it's quite easy to figure out bad VC. Just talk to people. They'll tell you who the bad VCs are. It's quite simple. You know, I can, I can name the good and the bad VCs myself based on my experience. Every entrepreneur who has gone through this experience will tell you who the good and the bad VCs are. It's quite simple. Please, but, but please take those advisors. All right, so end of phase two. Here's what, here's, here's what we were going through. We were a team of six to seven people with about $7 million. We were very close to each other. It's like a family. And the reason I'm raising these points is very important because we're going to go through a cultural change in, in this organization. And this cultural change in this organization is the most critical change. It is not about the growth. It's more about this cultural change. So we, we were like a family, like six, seven people, close-knit. I knew exactly what everybody else was doing. I was in total command. And everybody was involved in every decision. Right, so there was like nothing called, can we be on the same page? We were standing on the same page all the time. So I didn't have to do that, you know, figuring out is, do you know what we are doing? Do you know what we are doing? It was all, all good. And at that point of time, we were, you know, just to give you this metrics, we were doing about 80 million ads per month. That was all in India. And, you know, 80 million is roughly about two and a half, three million ads a day. We thought it was great, by the way. So we enter this third phase. Now third phase is when we have, ha now we have the money. We are confident. We are confident because we, we think, you know, we may be onto something big. So we do a couple of things. One of those things is to define our, define our large underlying strategy. We define our first strategy to say, we have to have significant focus on technology and building the best product. It was key. The reason that was key is because that will come on the next slide, but we wanted to build long-term value. We wanted to create value, create IP. We just did not want to go out and do something for the heck of it and make some money in the short term. There are tons of companies in the world which go out with substandard lack of IP products who get success in the beginning, but they fail towards the end. As you go through and build this into a large, as your company is into something larger, make sure you're following something which is far more fundamental. Because if you're doing something more fundamental, you will see the benefits of it and certainly in the long term. We were quite confident, and the reason we did this, we were quite confident that dig digital advertising is all about technology. It was not about people. It's not about putting people on the ground. You know, tons of companies exist, both in India and, and elsewhere, where they just put people on the ground, put tons and tons of sales guys. That's not how it works. That's not how it scales. You gotta understand what's going to scale your business and invest into that to begin with. And we did that. We tried to invest into the technology part. We, we started to get the best engineering talent that was available. And when I say best, we were pretty, and you know, trying to h hire as a, as a startup in 2007, 2008 is not easy because nobody trusts you. Like people only want those big brands. So hiring takes a lot of time. Till today, every individual hired in this company, I interview the person. And I plan to do that till we are 500 people. And the reason I do that is because that input is the most critical input coming in. And if you can make sure that that input is correct, then the outputs are far easier to manage. So stop trying to figure out how to get the output right, figure out how to get the input right. And if you can get the input right, the outputs are going to be much beyond what you can expect. So we started to try and get the best engineering talent, and we gave equity to everybody. In this company, everybody has equity. The reason everybody has equity is because that's why they are here. That's, the, that's, the, that's what we have tried to sell everybody. Because if, if you don't have equity, if the company succeeds, what's in it for you? Why will you stay when the times are going to be tough? And they will be tough. 
what's your decision going to be? How are you going to react? And if you're not going to react in the positive manner for the company, then, you know, few people have all the burden. I didn't want to take all the burden. Call me lazy if you want to, but I didn't want to take all the burden. I wanted the burden to be on everybody. It's so easy to manage if the burden is on everybody because everybody can share it with you. We did the second thing. We said we're going to be global and we're not going to be in India. A bold statement to make, but we said, yeah, we'll be global. It's as simple as that. We don't want to do anything else. We don't want to be in India. We wanted to hedge our bets. We want to de-risk ourselves. Now again, everybody came out and said, well, y you can't be global. I nobody does it in India. It's preposterous. You, you won't even know what the sales guy in, in Singapore is doing. You won't know what the sales guy in Jakarta is doing. My point to them is I actually don't even know what the guy in Delhi does. So it's equally bad for me. Or good. You don't understand the cultures. I'm like, actually, I don't even understand the culture of Delhi. Or Chennai. So it's same, right? I'm not even going to do the sale. And it did start to boil down, for me at least, to a far more simpler levels as I tried to break it down, trying to explain it to people. And what did it take to start a new geography, if you wanted to? What does it take to start Delhi? Well, you go to Delhi. All right? What does it take to start Singapore? You go to Singapore. It's an ex hour extra flight. That's it. That's all it takes. Please, people have overcomplicated this global stuff so much that it's gone, it's become so much easier. Because people have overcomplicated it, nobody does global stuff. So what happens? It's so much easier for you to do, do it. And so, I think w what happens as a result, we actually put a lot of pressure on our product and technology teams to deliver something which was global. And that that pressure on them was good because now they were forced to deliver something which was a global standard and not of India standard. They had to ensure that the product was going to go and compete in Jakarta, in Singapore, in Milan, or whatever, wherever we were going. And it was not easy. It's not easy because that raises the bar significantly. But we raised it. It was a forceful raise, raising of the bar. And we enjoyed it because everybody agreed to take on that challenge. It also changes, changes the outlook of the company, by the way, because you suddenly start to see things very differently. If you're only doing something which is, you know, for us, most of us were Indian, all of us were Indian, we were very confident with how, that we knew everything. As you start to take things into regions where you don't know stuff, you then start to do things in a more, uh, on, on the first principle basis. And doing things on the first principle basis is, you, you'll hardly get it wrong. Most of the time, you'll get it right. So that was a great advantage for us. The third thing that we had to do was, OK, fine, we decided that we wanted to go global. Where? There are 236 countries outside of India. Where do you want to go? Well, the not natural choice in most of the scenarios is go to US. Why? We've all gone there so many times. We get it. And so we looked at US and we said, yeah, largest market. You know, it's the growing market, et cetera. All the, all the logics suggested US is the best option. But we'd said there is one thing which is not making sense. It has 16 competitors ahead of us who have raised three to five X more money than us. 16 competitors in one market. Outside of that market, one competitor who is also in that market. And we'd like, Instead of fighting them in their region and, you know, we will be one of those 16 and, you know, we'll have to raise uh, another $25 million to go and do that fight, we might as well just not raise that much money and, and go into regions which make more sense for us. So go to Southeast Asia. So we went to Southeast Asia. We went to Africa. Both of these regions didn't have any competition. And what our viewpoint was, let's go into these regions, build scale, 